Okay. Good afternoon. Welcome to hearing number four of the 180 period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission. This hearing is called the situation of human rights of migrant people and people deprived of their liberty, liberty in Trinidad and Tobago. This hearing was required by the Caribbean Center of Human Rights of Trinidad and Tobago. My name is Julissa Mantilla. I'm the first vice president of the commission. I'm also the rapporteur for migrants. Today with me are Commissioner Estuardo Marrón and Commissioner Margaret May Macaulay, that is a rapporteur for women, are here with me. Today, we will give the floor to civil society for 30 minutes. Then the commission will have the same period of time for comments. And after that, we would like to give the floor back to civil society. Uh, we would like to mention you some other things. We have a clock to measure time and you will be able to see how much time you are left. We have simultaneous interpretation. We have closed caption caption and also the hearings we are on social media and will be uploaded to the YouTube channel channel of the Inter-American Commission. Please uh, mute yourself when you are not participating and turn your cameras on. Please introduce yourself. So I would like to give now the floor to the civil society. Denise, can you start? Okay. okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to introduce my colleague, CCHR co-chair, Caribbean Center for Human Rights, sorry, co-chair, Dr. Carolyn Gomes, and myself, Denise Pitcher, executive director of CCHR. On behalf of the Caribbean Center for Human Rights, we would like to thank the Organization of American States and the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights for this opportunity to highlight a very urgent situation facing migrants and persons deprived of their liberties in Trinidad and Tobago. We would like to express a heartfelt thank you to the lawyers, members of civil society who contributed to this report and to the migrants that, who share their stories. This was a truly collaborative effort where multiple stakeholders were engaged in a desire to see the human rights space expanded so that each and every person is able to enjoy the rights that they are entitled to. Before we begin our presentation, we would like to acknowledge the efforts that the government of Trinidad and Tobago has engaged in to honor their international obligations with respect to migrants and refugees. The government of Trinidad and Tobago established a national registration process in June 2019, where 15,653 Venezuelans were registered over a two week period. This nat national registration allows Venezuelans to legally live and work in Trinidad and Tobago and is renewed on a six month basis. This is a tremendous humanitarian gesture that has, al has allowed for the economic mobility, self-determination, and, and integration of migrants and refugees. However, there are several thousand more Venezuelans that were not able to register under this process, and there are over 30 other nationalities that seek asylum in Trinidad and Tobago and who were ex excluded from the national res registration process. We note with great appreciation the statements made by the Minister of National Security, Fitzgerald Hines, and Prime Minister Keith Rowley to diffuse public hostility towards Venezuelan migrants and discourage attempts to blame the Venezuelan community for the surge in COVID cases. The announcement by the Prime Minister of the inclusion of migrants and refugees in the vaccination program is a positive step in ensuring the protection of this vulnerable population and mitigating the risks of the pandemic. The facilitation of voluntary repatriation flights to ensure safe and dignified return of Venezuelans uh, wishing to return to Venezuela must also be commended. A pandemic does not mean that people cease to be in need of international protection. The crisis in Venezuela is ongoing and it is reasonable to assume that persons would continue to seek international protection. It would therefore, and, these, these obligations were also noted by Prime Minister Keith Rowley in his statement in Parliament in 2016. He says, it would therefore be remiss if an, if an acknowledgement is not given to the possible effect that an, that an increasingly unstable Venezuela will have on our own twin island nation state. 
However, the government will not be caught off guard in this situation as domestic efforts to address the refugee situation in Trinidad and Tobago has been ongoing since the government of Trinidad and Tobago acceded to the 1951 Refugee Convention and 1961 Protocol of Refugees and Asylum Seekers. We are aware that if the situation deteriorates to the point of a flow of refugees out of Venezuela, that Trinidad and Tobago has obligations under international law. I'll now go into the context in Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago is a party, as I as mentioned, to the 1951 Refugee Con Convention and its 1967 Protocol. Trinidad and Tobago established a draft na national ref policy to address refugee and asylum matters in 2014, but it remains in draft and has not been integrated into local legislation as yet. Trinidad is not a party to the Interna International Convention on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and members of their families. Currently, arrivals of migra migrants and refugees are treated under the 1976 Immigration Act, which lacks provisions to treat with asylum seekers and refugees and to address their particular vulnerabilities and needs. In the absence of domestic legislation and asylum procedures in Trinidad and Tobago, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees undertakes registration and refugee status determination. Under the draft refugee policy, a framework was established to provide guidance on how to treat asylum seekers and refugees. This draft policy outlines mechanisms to identify persons with legitimate claims and highlights the need for state officials to be trained to screen persons and identify specific needs. Despite no existing local refugee legislation, the Immigration Manual, Volume 1, articulates quite clearly how migrants and refugees are to be treated and what rights they are entitled to, and establishes standard operating procedures. Further, a refugee unit has been established to treat migrants and refugees. So while no refugee le legislation has been established, in practice, the government has undertaken efforts to implement elements of the refugee policy. Trinidad and Tobago, continues to return migrants, which may constitute reform law and violates our obligations under the convention and the right to, to asylum in the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man. CCHR has received reports of multiple persons registered with UNHCR and or with the government um, have been returned. The default response of the government has been that these migrants are in breach of the Immigration Act and that our borders are closed to mitigate the risks associated with travel and in breach of our health ordinance, ordinances, which have been established to protect public health. The Immigration Act does not recognize the non-penalization principle of the Refugee Convention. Generally, anyone found entering the country irregularly is charged with illegal entry, detained, and either released after a bond is paid and issued an order of supervision, so, or they are deported to their country of origin. This practice is not applied consistently as some persons are returned while some are allowed to stay on an order of supervision. Border closures due to COVID-19 mean that all persons entering the country are branded as illegal and the asylum process is further criminalized. The returns of migrants and asylum seekers is particularly concerning in the context of COVID-19. A report by Amnesty International describes state-run quarantine facilities in Venezuela as inhumane and a breeding ground for the spread of, of COVID-19. The recent report by the UN Human Rights Council, which accuses Venezuelan government officials of crimes against humanity, as to the belief that persons are returned to a place where their lives and freedom are at risk. Persons that are, are deported from Trinidad and Tobago often not allowed the opportunity to challenge the deportation orders, which is a violation of rights enshrined in, Trin in Trinidad and Tobago's constitution. To highlight the human rights issues of migrants and refugees and persons deprived of their liberties in Trinidad and Tobago, we refer to the case of the deportations of 16 children and nine women that took place in November, 2020. This instance is by no means the exception, but indicative of a systematic of systematic violations of human rights of migrants and refugees and underscores the urgency for a legal framework to ensure the rights of migrants and refugees are protected. 16 children and nine adult women were initially detained in a police jail on Tuesday, November 17th for irregular entry. The lawyer acting on their behalf submitted a letter for their release to the chief immigration officer, which received no response. The lawyer received reports the following Saturday, November 21st, that they were going to be put on boats to be returned to Venezuela. A habeas corpus application was filed on Saturday evening and a hearing was set for Sunday. 
The lawyer later received reports early Sunday morning that the women and children were being removed from the jails and being taken to the port to be returned to Venezuela, despite the habeas corpus application, which was scheduled to be heard later that day. Um, I just want to share, can I share some, I just want to share a photo of um, the, I need to share my screen. Can I go ahead and share my screen? Eh, sí, por favor, si sí, me autorizan para compartir pantalla. This is a photo of the child, women and children being placed on the boats. Um, where is it? Screen. Okay, and then where is the photo? Can you see the photo? Yes? Okay. So this is the two boats that they were they were placed on. Okay, so let me stop share screen. I'm trying to expand my window. There's so many things open. Okay, stop share. When the hearing was called on Sunday, November 22nd. Representatives from for the immigration division were not present and the children were not presented as instructed. Confusion ensued as to who was responsible for taking the children to the boats. It was eventually revealed that the Coast Guard were the ones responsible. It should be noted that several persons that were, that were placed on the boats had family members in Trinidad and Tobago who were not informed of the whereabouts of their family members. The boats were escorted by Trinidad and Tobago's Coast Guard out of, Tr of Trinidad and Tobago's territorial waters on Sunday, November 22nd at 11 a.m. The judge on Sunday, 22nd November at midnight ordered that the children be produced by midnight, midday the next day. The lawyer for the state informed that the boat was escorted out of Trinidad's territorial waters and therefore the courts no longer had jurisdiction on the matter. The boat could not be located for around 48 hours and eventually made it back to Trinidad on November 24th, where the women and children were placed in jail cells. They were eventually transferred to the heliport in Chagaramas, where they were detained until their release in January 2021. Several of the children in this matter, their fathers reside legally in Trinidad and Tobago, either they are registered with the government or UNHCR. Therefore, the principle of family reunification applied. Um, there is, I just want to share another video. We have another video of where the children were placed in the jail cells. So. Okay, so, just, sorry, just bear with me. This particular case and the disjointed ad hoc response emphasizes the need for a legal framework that can establish a coordinated response that prevents placing vulnerable persons at further risk and upholds our international obligations and the law. For 2020, we recorded 745 persons deported and 611 persons detained. The majority were Venezuelans. The numbers may vary slightly. This number also only represents persons and not asylum seekers and refugees. With respect to immigration detention, immigration detention policies and procedures in Trinidad and Tobago are a grave concern for the Caribbean Center for Human Rights. 
because of the lack of a legal framework to treat refugees and lack of screening mechanisms, migrants are charged with illegal entry in violation of the non-penalization principle. They are often held for indefinite periods without sufficient legal basis and for periods beyond what is considered reasonable. Persons have been, have been held in immigration detention for months and even years. This contradicts the guidelines articulated in the draft refugee policy, which states that persons may not be held for more than 10 days without sufficient legal basis. There is currently a Nigerian national who has been held in the immigration detention center for the past eight years. Asylum seekers receive little support or guidance from the state as to their rights. The immigration detention facility at Aripo has been described by detainees as unsanitary and inhumane. And there have been a number of protests by detainees about the conditions. The conditions in remand are also incredibly inhumane and there is severe overcrowding. Such conditions create a breeding ground for the spread of, COVID of the COVID-19 virus and other diseases, which threaten detainees' right to health and right to life. So I just have one more video that I'm gonna share of the center in Aripo. Para que se escuche, tendrías que compartir. You have to share also the sound. But. We, we can take you through this commissioner in terms of what they're saying. Okay. Okay. Okay, and now I'll hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Carolyn Gomes, for the rest of our presentation. Um, just very briefly before I start, um, Denise, could you stop the screen share? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, apologies, and I hope you're seeing me. Um, just very briefly before we start, it just to explain that in that video, it's actually a Spanish, a native Spanish speaker speaking in English complaining about the detention conditions, complaining about the overcrowding, saying that they're human beings, they just want a chance to live and work, and they're detained in there, they haven't had any opportunity to get out of there, they don't know when they're going to get out of there, they're overcrowded, they get one hour a day to be outside and for one hour in a 24 hour period, and there is no clarity on when they will be all allowed out. It's so, and they also point to a gentleman in the cell that you don't see very well, but they say this is a Nigerian gentleman who has been here for eight years. We don't know what is going on. You'll also notice in the video that there are uh, several persons in the video who look younger than 18. We have, don't have any confirmation of their ages, but there are a number of them that look like adolescents. I'd like to tell you a little bit and expand on this question of children in detention. We have received several reports that women and children are not separated from male detainees in those detention facilities. And migrant children often share spaces with other adults. I think you would have seen some of that on the um, brief video that he showed. Of particular concern is that children have also been held at the Shagaramas detention facility for ex extended periods, which violates the best interests of the child principle. Delivering a decision at the hearing in the case of the 16 children, Justice Joan Charles noted that Trinidad and Tobago's immigration laws and policies do not provide any guidance for the detention and deport of deportation of children. I'd like to bring to the Commission's attention a recent judgment from the Privy Council, 
um, Privy Council Appeal Number 0112 of 2019, Commissioner of Prisons and Others, versus Sipasad and another applicant, appellants from Trinidad and Tobago. The Privy Council at paragraph 75 made the following finding. Fundamentally, the executive brought into operation the material provisions of the Children Act without having first put in place the arrangements necessary to give effects to their mandatory requirements in a context where the intended beneficiary cohort of these measures, namely children, had been identified by both international law and domestic law as deserving of special protection. This had a series of substantial consequences. The operation of several interrelated provisions of primary legislation were rendered impotent during a protracted period. The aforementioned cohort was deprived of the benefits and protections prescribed by the legislature. International norms were violated. The appellants were thereby exposed to conditions, environments, and influences which the, frust which the frustrated legislative provisions were designed to avoid. The chief magistrate was compelled to make a series of unlawful remand orders. The appellants were deprived of their liberty pursuant to such orders and the legal systems of Trinidad and Tobago did not provide them with a timeous and if efficacious remedies. While this judgment was rendered in an appeal involving Trinidadian nationals, it is equally applicable to the situation of migrant children in Trinidad and Tobago. The children, that children are deserving of special care and protection in all circumstances is not in dispute. That Venezuelan migrant children are not receiving the special, that special care and protection is also not in dispute. The failure of the state to provide the resources and in arrangements required to give effect to its own laws and obligations has the effect of exposing all children to conditions, environments, and influences which violate their rights. There's also a real concern about the lack of transparency in the operation of these detention centers. We, CCHR submitted a freedom of information request in September 2020, seeking information on the procedures and protocols with respect to immigration detention. We have yet to receive a response from the Immigration Division, which is a breach of the Freedom of Information Act. There's a lack of transparency by the government with respect to monitoring of conditions in immigration detention. Independent bodies and civil society actors have not been allowed access to immigration detention facilities, and this predates the pandemic, so it's not a consequence of the pandemic. CCHR is particularly concerned about the COVID health protocols in immigration detention. We also had a recent report of an asylum seeker contracting COVID-19 whilst in immigration detention. As you would have seen from the video, there is no separation um, in, the, in that detention facility that we showed you. Additionally, when persons are deported, there have been instances where everybody is placed on the same vessel together, irregardless of where they were staying, irregardless of quarantine, COVID testing, Nothing is known about the people next to them on the boat when they are deported. Orders of supervision serve as an alternative to detention, but that practice is applied inconsistently and requires the payment of a bond, which many migrants are unable to pay. We have received reports that there are 10 children currently in detention who will not be released before the bond, in pay, bond is paid and the families are scrambling to gather that bond together. And this is in fact a violation of the non-penalization principle. The situation in immigration detention facilities in Trinidad and Tobago remains an urgent one, given the inhumane conditions, the lack of transparency by the government, detention of persons for indefinite periods, the criminalization of the asylum process, the lack of information on the policies and procedures of immigration detention, and the detention of children in breach of the government's obligation to provide special care for them. We have a number of other cases that we would refer to. We won't use them this hearing, but certainly are happy to provide information to the commission on the specifics. We have one in, in, in so I'll talk you through a little bit the, the situation, why, why some of the delays. 
The Trinidad and Tobago Constitution states that everyone has access to a fair trial, yet far too often persons are deported without having an opportunity to challenge their deportations or, their, or, or the lack of hearing of their asylum claims. As the cases involving the 16 children and highlight, obtaining access to justice and the right to due process is very difficult for migrants and refugees. There are several features of the process of seeking asylum through the courts in Trinidad and Tobago, which make it difficult for asylum seekers to claim their rights. Multiple adjournments are a feature of Trinidad and Tobago's criminal justice system, not just the immigration hearings or habeas corpus hearings. It's a feature of the court system, which result in long delays between hearings and a detention period pending asylum application determination of months, if not years, and frustration. And many persons abandon their applications because they're stuck in detention, waiting a hearing over prolonged periods and sometimes think it's better they, they, they just get on another boat and get deported back to Venezuela. Um, these de delays and multiple adjournments result in the denial of rights of migrants and refugees. Effectively, these delays and multiple adjournments and the conditions in which they are kept in detention pending determination of their cases threaten not only their right to health and the right to a hearing within a reasonable time, and their right not to be arbitrarily detained without a legal basis, it's on occasion threaten their right to life. Many of the deportation challenges end up in the high court um, and migrants and refugees lack the resources and skills legal representation to substantively challenge state actions against them. Lack of a consistent policy and exercise expertise in the application of that policy. Lack of familiarity with human rights and international law at all levels of the legal fraternity, including the judiciary, means that migrants and refugees have limited opportunity for justice in the courts of Trinidad and Tobago. I want to touch now a little bit on human trafficking. According to a recent report by Connectus, an international center for journalists, 21,000 Venezuelan women and girls have been trafficked into Trinidad and Tobago in the last six years. Trinidad and Tobago is a signatory to the United Nations, Conven United Nations Convention Against Transnational Crime and its protocols. And it has established the Trafficking, um, trafficking in Persons Unit and the Trafficking in Persons Act to investigate cases of trafficking. In spite of local legislation and the establishment of the counter-trafficking unit, where significant resources have been expended, human trafficking networks have exploded in relation to the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela, which has seen increased flows of vulnerable persons who are lured by traffickers on false promises of jobs. Many of them end up, many of these vulnerable women end up working in brothels. The US State Department in 2020, its 2020 Trafficking in Persons report has maintained its tier two ranking of Trinidad and Tobago due to its inability to meet the minimum standards to combat human trafficking. The report actually links government officials to trafficking in persons. A 2019 CARICOM report linked the Trinidad and Tobago police service to human smuggling and trafficking rings between Venezuela and Trinidad and Tobago. Prime Minister Keith Rowley has indicated that stiff penalties are imminent and there's recognition that gaps still exist in the legislation. However, much more must be done to curb this very serious human rights issues. Very few persons have been charged and prosecuted for this crime and not a single government official or police officer has been charged. Who ends up being charged and detained are usually the persons who were trafficked in raids on the brothels where they're working and they can spend months and years awaiting deportation without access to victim services and without being able to access places and persons to whom they can report what was done to them. And in fact, we've received reports from victims of trafficking who have complained that there's been limited or no follow-up of their cases. This reality will discourage others from coming forward as the laws are not being enforced 
to match the scale of the issue. Additionally, victims are reluctant to report their situation for fear of being targeted because of the involvement, which many of them are aware of, of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service in human smuggling and trafficking. Combating human trafficking should be a priority because it's a major factor in increasing the irregular flow into Trinidad and Tobago and placing vulnerable persons at risk. We also want to report very quickly an increase in the um, gender-based violence and the susceptibility of these trafficked women and girls, as well as the general population of, of persons um, fleeing from Venezuela to gender-based violence. They're vulnerable to sexual exploitation, threats from those who employ them, that if they don't provide sex, they will report them or deport them. And the community itself has seen an increase in gender-based violence. Another issue that should, is of concern to us is the lack of access for migrant children to schooling. The, the children are not eligible to attend government schools. There is a program that is attempting to educate them, which the government is collaborating with, and it's delivered a collaboration of UNHCR, CHR, CR, the UNICEF, and um, Implementing Partner Living Water Community in Thank December you. 29th. Thank yeah. you. I'm sorry, we are over the time. Estamos fuera del tiempo. Quizás we are running out of time. Maybe in the second round we could continue, please. Thank you very much. You will have a second round because the clock started over again. We have, we're over the time. We finished the time. Okay. The part we can, you can follow with the, the, the time, the, the things. Um, ahora me gustaría, eh, por favor, darle la palabra. Now I would like to give the floor to the commissioners. I would like to give the floor first to Commissioner Estuardo Relón, that is the country rapporteur. Thank you, Madam President. Good afternoon. Thank you, Commissioner Margaret, as well. I would like also to greet and to welcome the Caribbean Center of Human Rights. I would like to say that I'm surprised and shocked by the pictures that you share with us because of the detailed information regarding the reports and behaviors that are violating human rights, especially with regard to uh, the emphasis on migration and because we see that there is uh, arbitrary deprivation of liberty and we see that people are treated in humane condi inhumane conditions and this affects minors as well as the people who are uh, in human mobility because they have the need to leave their countries. As you well know, the, within the Inter-American Commission, there is a structure of the way we organize things. And therefore, there are some commissioners that are country reporters, and there are other commissioners that are thematic reporters. I'm, I am the country reporter for Trinidad and Tobago, and I'm also the thematic reporter for persons deprived of their liberty and the comeback of torture. This information that you are sharing with us shows that there is a very detailed work of collecting information regarding the sad situation that is happening in Trinidad and Tobago. This hearing helps make the situation visible. And I would invite you to share with us and information, videos, documents, reports, everything that you have been working on and that you have not sent to the commission yet, we beg you to send that to us. I would uh, also request the support of the executive secretariat so that they could help us so that um, you could send us the information. I'm really sorry that the representatives of the state are not here. The hearing was thought for 
the petitioners and civil society to be here and for the state to be here because this mechanism is not only for making the situation visible but also for the state to have the possibility of reacting to what you have said or also by providing some line of implementation for a possible public policy or it could help them revert a situation as country reporter I would try to communicate uh, this information to the plenary of the commission. So I think that we should follow up on this situation. This hearing should be just a starting point and it could be possible that uh, according to our, our rules of procedures, we could send a letter to the state with a set of questions after analyzing all the information that you have that you send us. We could ask the state about some specific situation so they could provide us with more information in order to understand the situation or the current situation and to provide technical assistance to the state so that they could improve some aspects, especially regarding the elimination of some behavior such as criminalization in some proceedings or arbitrary detentions. And also when there are degrading and inhumane conditions for people. Um, together with us uh, is Commissioner Mantisha, who is the rapporteur for migrants, and she will provide a very detailed analysis with a focus on migrants. And I know that she will also be at uh, your disposal to work together, the country and the thematic rapporteurship to work together. What I would like to say is that we are uh, noting what you are saying and we will transfer our concerns and your concerns to the plenary in order to see how we can act within the jurisdiction of the commission in order to promote that some behaviors are eliminated. In, and we will promote the enforcement of public policies with a human rights approach. So again, I would like to thank uh, the work of the Caribbean Center for Human Rights for being here so prepared and for bringing to the table important detailed information that gives us a perspective of the critical situation that is occurring in Trinidad and Tobago. So we are at your disposal. Thank, thank you, Vice President. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I would like to give the floor to Commissioner May Macaulay, that is a rapporteur for women's rights. I am trying to get my... Uh, I hope you can hear me. I've been fiddling with the interpretation back and forth. <laughs> Thank you. Um, before I start, I have to say a special hello to Caroline. This is disgusting. We live in the same city and this is how we're seeing each other. <laughs> this is awful. Anyway, it's good to hear, see you and hear you. I wish it was on some other issue. And nice to meet you, Denise. And thank you all who are present for, and thanks the two of you for your, your absolutely comprehensive report, which is extremely concerning for all the rapporteurships present here today, and also for the rapporteurship on economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights, I'm sure. Uh, we'll have some concern on this, and there she is. <laughs> and I, I, Soledad, I didn't know you were here. Thank goodness you're here and also the Rapporteur on Children's Rights, my very good friend Esmeralda, um, who we shall also report to. In fact, what my brother Strada has said about um, the Article 18 letter, uh, um, inquiring, uh, us putting specific questions to the state, um, that letter would come from all the relevant rapporteurships, the must do. But I have, I have to say that I 
personally, I'm not really surprised um, about what you've reported about the state of the detention areas. Uh, um, because we had a, a, a public hearing with former commissioner uh, Rosemary Antoine on the state of the prisons and the operations of the court some time ago. I can't remember if, if Lisa, you and Strado were here, um, but if so, I'm not sure whether you were on, on that panel. And they informed us of the de extraordinary delays in legal processes uh, of matters going to court, which have to do with the rights of people and persons being waiting for trial for nine, 10 years and, and things like that. So I wasn't really surprised at this, but I thought that there would have been some improvement after the recommendations we made. And seemingly not, because if their own citizens awaiting trial in the criminal courts can be treated that way, it's not surprising they're treating those they consider strangers in their country badly. But one would have thought that when it comes to women and children who are escaping very difficult conditions in their home state and are looking for assistance and refuge, they would in fact apply all the international norms and standards and regulations and laws which apply in such circumstances. And clearly not, so we will have to act. I am very happy that you gave me the numbers about the women trafficked, Venezuelan women trafficked, because this is some, this is information which I was unaware of and will, will pass on to my specialists in my rapporteurship um, so that we can delve into it more deeper. So I'm asking you if you could give us uh, all the information you have in that regard um, so that we can deal with, with them specifically and also all information that you have about sexual violations of, of, of women, uh, um, um, especially those um, which they are uh, imposed upon them in their workplace. Those who are lucky enough to be there and to have work for, for them to be under duress um, sexual, for sexual favors is, is egregious. Um, so if we can have some more information on that as well. And, as, and, and also, of course, all the information you have relating to children, the violation of children's rights so that our, our sister Commissioner Esmeralda could have those in her rapporteurships, um, in her rapporteurship. I, 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 I don't think um, as, as Strada said, we, he has mentioned the mechanisms we can use immediately um, to that. But of course, we cannot force the state to attend, even though we do make comments about their failure to attend such public uh, meetings, being not in the spirit of, of what one expects of state parties to the inter-American system. Uh, um, because it is not helpful when the states are not present. Um, um, but we will do what we can. Um, certainly from uh, women's rapporteurship, we will do that. And do you have any, do you have any specific information as to Afro-descendant Venezuelans, Afro-Venezuelans? If you do, please send the, those to us as well because I'm the rapporteur for, for um, Afro-descendant rights and against um, um, discrimination. So with that, thank you very, very much. And Caroline, I'm gonna call you. <laughs> yes. Muchas gracias. Yes. Thank you, can't... Commissioner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Muchas gracias, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner for your presentation. Before giving the floor to the special rapporteur, 
as Commissioner Estuardo was saying, It would be good to have the state present so as to be able to talk about this topic. I would like to say that there is a legal framework beyond the treaties, but the operative use uh, cohen rules against discrimination. And the situation that we are living and that we are seeing is a situation of discrimination against a group, in this case, Venezuelan people and migrants. And in that sense, we should re remember our Inter-American Principles, Resolution 499, that establishes certain ideas and principles that by the, through the video and information you bring to us are not being complied with. We also have Resolution 2, to 2018 for the Venezuelan refugees and Resolution 1, 2020, which was issued specifically during the pandemic and we had and i'm going to focus on this we had the the difficulties that were already existing and you're telling us about have been increased had been worsened with these uh, overcrowding and these affectations to human rights the commission knows about the situation that is why we issued resolution 9320 precautionary measures in the case of five kids that were deported from trinidad and tobago and we thank you for the information you provide us because that's a resolution on migrant people and moving people people who are displaced who are looking for as who are seeking asylum and have has a differentiated vision. That information you can uh, provide it to us and with Commissioner Rallon and Commissioner McCauley, we are going to seek the mechanism so as to try to look for answers from the state. And I would like to thank you for the information you have given us today and all this continuity of violence as you establish is completely proven how many women and girls escape from their countries, in this case Venezuela, not only because of the general situation of violation of human rights, but because of uh, violation, gender violation, and getting to spaces where they are going to keep on receiving violations, we are violating their reproductive and sexual rights and the people and the ch children born up from those violations. This is a very serious situation. Thank you once more. I am going to give the floor to Rapporteur uh, for Economic, Culture and Social Rights, Soledad Garcia. I would also like to briefly thank you as uh, Commissioner Margaret was saying, there are lots of topics in this hearing that give rise to other to our concern. This is a very dramatic situation and I congratulate you for the work you have done for these people that are really suffering. And it is dramatic because it's given in times of pandemic, Commissioner Mantilla had already talk, talked about resolution one slash 2020 of the commission. There are also two other resolutions which are applicable to the con pandemic context, which is for 2020 with of people with COVID-19 and the videos you showed us of overcrowding of women, children, and people deprived of their of their freedom make us think of the uh, of how easy the virus is uh, infected. And so take that resolution into consideration. And resolution uh, also about the vaccine as well, especially for reasons of human mobility. Also, we are willing to receive further information on this topic. We are really worried about these absence of health protocols that you were mentioning and it would be necessary to know how, what the, the situation would be in terms of the right to water right to education the situation of those girls and boys that are in that situation 
Thank you, Rapporteur. I will give back the floor to the civil society, Dina, Denise and Calorine, so that you can comment on this. You have 30 minutes. Thank you so very much um, um, for the reception and for hearing us and for um, acknowledging what we are telling you about the conditions and our worry about what's happening. Um, I first want to thank Commissioner Stuardo um, for his, for his um, talking about a letter to the states. We have a few other recommendations that I'll indulge your, your time and your patience to just put on the table for the commission. Um, clearly our report sets out things that are wrong and that things that need to change. Um, and it highlights the need for the international community to be in solidarity with Trinidad and Tobago, because this is not a, this is not a situation that it's, it's overwhelming to the authorities, but it's also overwhelming in other places in the Caribbean. So we would want the international community to support Trinidad to implement and to uphold its own obligations. And so we would really ask, in addition to the letter, if it would be possible for the commission to actually have a visit to Trinidad and Tobago to see for yourselves um, the situation, to meet with the authorities, to help work with them, to, to see what can be done and where the assistance can come from. Um, but we would also ask when you write to the state, if you could ask them about this draft policy since 2014, because it needs finalization and it needs implementation. It has a draft policy for Nash, to address refugee and asylum matters, but because it's not, it's not in, uh, um, gone beyond draft, it does not allow for coordination. It doesn't allow for clear um, implementation, clear standards, clear accountability from the people who have to, to do the work to look after and address the situation of, of migrants and refugees. And so we'd also ask you if you could talk to the state about training for the officers on their duties and accountabilities under a finalized policy um, and request the state to establish a working group with civil society and government as well as relevant international agencies for the implementation of this policy. So finalize it, train on it, but also ask the state to coordinate with local and international stakeholders to ensure that it's implemented with clear lines of responsibility and accountability for all stakeholders. And there are a lot of stakeholders, the Coast Guard, the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, the Immigration Division, the Prison Service, the Health Services, the Children's Services in Trinidad and Tobago, the courts, the judiciary, we need to have a coordinated effort from all of those who are going to have to play a part in ensuring that the protections are afforded right across the board in a, in a manner that opposes Trinidad's international obligations. We'd also ask you to request the state to undertake public education combating xenophobia and highlighting refugees' rights and protections outlining how and to whom citizens may raise concerns about illegal migration and trafficking in persons. Who do they talk to? Who do they report to? As well as how and from whom migrants can claim asylum and report breaches of their rights. We'd request the commission if, if you can work with to facilitate and coordinate a regional and international approach to the issues of migrants and refugees, particularly those from Venezuela, but this in the Caribbean. Suriname, Guyana, Aruba, Curaçao, a number of the smaller islands of the Caribbean chain struggle, struggle with the number of refugees from Venezuela, struggle with upholding their international obligations. Um, and it, we certainly would benefit from some coordination leadership of, of the effort to support these countries who very often want to do the right things but are overwhelmed. Um, so the policy is important and its implementation and the training. I'd also ask if you can, if there can be a dialogue with the government of Trinidad and Tobago about um, moving expeditiously to develop and pass a comprehensive immigration law that codifies 
how the state will fulfill its international obligations to migrants and refugees while protecting and enforcing its control over immigration and into its territory. A law supersedes a policy and a law that, such as this would give the state the ability to screen persons entering the country and identify persons in need of protection, would give it a, sta a status and a standing and a structure that would allow the state to know exactly how to protect migrants and refugees from exploitation and abuse, how to support efforts to combat trafficking, smuggling and other criminal activities and facilitate migrant workers entry into the labor force. Trinidad is not in a vacuum and that's why we are here today with you. It exists in a, in a global community in which there are expectations of adherence to standards and norms and from which assistance is available and could be utilized to ensure that it the state fulfills its commitments. And so we, we at CCHR urge the commission to enter into a dialogue with the state. We hope they will, because we have in good faith outlined for you the measures that they have taken to try and remedy the situation, that they are not enough, that they are not strong enough and that they still result in rights abuses. There are still rights abuses ongoing. Perhaps Trinidad and Tobago could benefit from the reassurance of the support um, and intention of the commission to help them. Denise, I don't know if you want to add anything. No, I think Carolyn has done a, a tremendous job at outlining uh, all the recommendations. You know that that we're, you know we hope that the government will take take heed. Um, with res I do have some photos that I can share with respect to the conditions in the prisons, um, because migrants and refugees they are uh, held um, in um, remand and in maximum security prison prisons and they're charged for irregular entry. So, and they're being housed with criminals that have uh, committed more serious offenses. So it's, it's, it's extremely disturbing and that they're, they're held indefinitely. One more point uh, to touch on is that currently in immigration detention, communication is cut off. Person immigration detainees are not able to communicate with anyone outside. Uh, we receive those, that information from lawyers acting on their behalf. Um, and that violates um, violates their, their rights. They're, they're, they're supposed to be afforded um, the right to, to have communication, to communicate with friends, family members, um, you know, legal uh, legal representatives, etc. So I, I will just share. Just let me just find the document to show the conditions, which have been um, incredibly the prison. The conditions in prisons are incredibly inhumane. Uh, since the last hearing, um, I don't, I, I think things may have, got, may have gotten worse if, if it has remained unchanged. And uh, persons in remand in particular as well do, they're severely frustrated. So let me just share screen. Can you all see the photo? So this is these were these were sent by um, were circulated on social media by Ramandis. So basically, this one is showing where um, they Ramandis have to urine through their gates into the drains, and of course, they're exposed to that to those smells and conditions. Um, it's 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 incredibly inhumane. Um, this one, it's their food remanded, and this is where this was an instance where they were. Uh, in protest and they went on a hunger strike, um, protesting against the COVID restrictions and the inhumane conditions. And so they, they left their food outside. Um, again, another one showing where the food, food sharing, right where, so this is the area where the food is being distributed. And these are all the drains here as well too, where uh, they, they urinate and these are the conditions that they are living in. I think, yeah, that's those are those are the three photos. But uh, yeah, the situation in Ramand is particularly um, cruel and inhumane. Um, also, there were measures. The Attorney General in 
early 2020 announced um, measures to reduce the risk of COVID in, in prisons by releasing, um, by saying that he's gonna release non-violence uh, persons that committed minor offenses. When in fact, very few, very few persons have been released. So the prison population still remains at the same levels that it has been since, uh, since the start of the pandemic. Um, there have been spikes uh, in, in, in remand in the prisons with respect to the inmates and also prison, prison officers. And uh, we've, I, I'm not sure if you are familiar with what's happening in Trinidad and Tobago, but we, we have a, a serious surge in Trinidad and Tobago. Now it's, it's sort of stabilizing, but we do have the Brazilian variant and it's dominating uh, or it's beginning to dominate the number of cases. And you know, that's, that's going to be a serious situation for persons in immigration detention and prisons. And the, the, what's, what's also concerning is that vulnerable persons, you know, both migrants and refugees and persons in, in, in prisons, they have compromised health, health conditions and they don't have uh, proper nutrition. They don't get proper nutrition that, you know, can support their immune systems. You know they have compromised immune systems, so all of these things threaten their right to right, right to life, their right to health, and um, are, are extremely disconcerting and you know warrant urgent action. I'm I'm not sure if Carolyn wants to add anything to that. Sorry, mute button. Um, no, I I don't want to add anything more. I think it it, it the conditions have been dreadful for a long time. Uh, the overcrowding has been worsened by COVID. Um, the, the risks have been worsened by the COVID and the overcrowding has not lessened. We are using penitentiaries across the region that were built in the 1800s and are unfit for purpose. And then we are stacking people one on top of another in cells built for far less of a crowd. And then our court systems work inefficiently. So people are kept on remand for, for years for offenses that they are not convicted of. So it, it warrants urgent attention. And, and would they, certainly we would be grateful for the attention of the commissioners. Thank you. Como tenemos tiempo, la comisionada Macaulay. Uh, Since hello. we have time, I think that Commissioner May Macaulay would like to take the floor. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, Vice President, thank you. Um, yes, I wanted I wanted to ask um, in relation to sanitizing sanitizing uh, materials whether the the government provides that and sufficiently in 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 the remand centers and the prisons and and lockups and and also yeah I thought about something else and also. Um, do, do, uh, does Venezuela still have a consulate there? A consulate office there, yes? Yes, so yes, that there's, there is a consulate. They're not permitted to, to even make calls to the consulate? I, I'm, I, Venezuelans do go to the consulate, but, but the thing about it is um, some of these asylum seekers and refugees are They're hesitant not. to, yes. sorry. I understand. We'll not right. want to make contact, but exactly. some might in desperation. Some might. Yes. Uh, like uh, currently, with the vo so because of the pandemic and the loss of jobs, um, a number of them are applying or are working with the Venezuelan consulate to return, and the government of Trinidad and Tobago are f trying to facilitate uh, okay. these repatriations. And I wanted to ask Caroline. I'm I'm not sure that you you mentioned the thing about the complicity of police officers in trafficking of women. Um, I, um, but I don't think you mentioned it as one of the the um, 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 things you're asking the the commission to do. I'm sure you would want us to ask the government to um, investigate that and and. In, or, and use all due diligence that they should in that regard. Absolutely, um, and, and thank you for raising this, uh, Margaret. I, it is, we, we really need to strengthen both the units and that it has been established and resource it, but we also need to strengthen 
the investigation of these reports, including the one done by CARIC, by, by, by the US um, and, and also CARICOM, because mm -hmm. we, we need to, to use the intelligence, that's the intelligence that these women are prepared to give, mm -hmm. but will only give in a protected space, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A, a space where they can be assured is not going yeah. to go back and not going to, and, yeah. and their response has been, in far too many instances, the, an arrest of the persons they find in the brothel, a shutdown for a temporary period of the brothel owners, uh, and a reopening in two weeks while the women, with a different set of girls, while the women who they picked up remain in remand or in detention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gracias. And, and yes, Caroline. Thank you, Caroline. My apologies. I mean, we have time, so this is this is not what we used to usually do, but we we have time, and it was very important for us to to listen to you. Well, I'd like to finish this hearing saying thank you again for the information. I think that's a very good thing that we are the rapporteur of women, migrant rapporteur, a country rapporteur, and the social economic right rapporteur, and I like to. Uh, say something that I was thinking when Caroline talked about how um, Trinidad y Tobago no es como no está sola, sino que está dentro de todo lo de, del mundo y es parte de este sistema interamericano. That Trinidad and Tobago is part of this interamerican system. It's part of international community. It's part of the states of the OAS. It's not in a void. That's an important point. So. Uh, you should know that the commission is committed, and I say this as vice president, that we will uh, consider the agreements, the requests, so we could help make this situation visible. Thank you again for your great work. And apart from that, we would like to highlight your hope. If you're here, it's because you have hope. and. The commission is here for you. Thank you. And I'm concluding the hearing. Goodbye.